Good morning. My name is Kim Jones, and I'm the coordinator for Healthcare for All West Virginia. We're excited to be here um, in our last day of our Medicaid summit, and we would like to particularly thank the RX Foundation and Benedum for making our uh, 2022 Medicaid summit possible. If you have any questions at the end of our um, at the end of our session, please put them in the Q and A, and we'll get to all of them at the end. Um, I'm so pleased and excited to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Georgiana Logan is an assistant professor and research associate at Marshall University. She's from Flint, Michigan and received her PhD in health education and health promotion from the University of Alabama and a master's degree in health education from the University of Michigan. Dr. Logan is a thought-provoking educator and a renowned professional development strategist and mentor for over 20 years with on, over 20 years of experience in the workforce. She serves on several academic state and national health um, and diversity committees. She's also received numerous awards and multiple requests to speak nationally. Lastly, Dr. Logan has presented at numerous local, state, and national conferences on her research endeavors, which include health disparities, health equity, men's health, environmental justice, and fatherhood. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Logan. Morning, good morning. Thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. I'm so excited to be here with you all this morning. Thank you all for joining this presentation. I wanna thank Kim Jones, who personally reached out to me as a representative for Healthcare for All West Virginians and their coalition partners for inviting me to speak and share a little bit about social determinants of health, health policy and Medicaid insurance. So I'll go ahead and share my screen with you. Hopefully everyone can see my screen as we kick off this or in or wrap up this West Virginia virtual Medicaid summit. And so I am like Ms. Kim said, Dr. Georgiana Logan, Assistant Professor and Research Associate over at Marshall University. I've been at Marshall for almost four years now. So I moved to West Virginia from Alabama back in the end of 2018. And I started my career at Marshall in January of 2019. I primarily teach in our Department of Health Science and Public Health Department, which is our graduate uh, program at Marshall University. And so in today's presentation, we're going to talk about a purpose and introduction. Why are we all here? I'm going to go over a few definitions with you. We're going to talk about social determinants of health and what the heck is that. We're going to talk about Medicaid in West Virginia, public health practice. So knowing what we know, where do we go from here? And going to talk a little bit about what's in the news, what's going on with Medicaid as of recently. And so... The purpose and presentation, purpose and introduction of this presentation is to discuss how social determinants of health impact Medicaid programming and policies and have led to health disparities as a result of health inequities faced by low income populations, communities of color and other marginalized communities. And so when we talk about health disparities, uh, we first have to talk about social determinants of health. And so those are the conditions and the places where people live, learn, work, and play and pray that affect a wide range of health risks and outcomes. Health disparities are those preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, and or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. So those are populations as identified or defined by their race or ethnicity, their gender, education, income, disability, geographic location, or sexual orientation. And so social determinants of health and health disparities often result from what we call health equity, which is us providing access to care that does not vary in quality because of those personal characteristics that we previously mentioned, right? And so when you think about health inequities, health inequities are dif differences in length of life, quality of life, race of disease, disability and, and death, 
severity of disease, and access to treatment. So really when we talk about this concept of health equity, our overall goal is to attain the highest level of health for all people. How do we do that when we factor in what we know about social determinants, health disparities, health equity, that all leads to health inequities? And so although we've done a great job at providing Medicaid coverage to those in need, health disparities still exist. And so let's talk about it a little bit further. And so when I talk about the social determinants of health, there are five key domains that make up these determinants. The first one is healthcare access and quality. So that's the connection between people access to and understanding of health services and their own health. So these domains include access to health care, access to primary care, health insurance coverage, and health literacy. And when we talk about health literacy, that's us as providers being able to break down complex medical jargon in such a way that patients and families can make the best and appropriate health decisions for themselves. We also have the domain of education, access, and quality. So that's where we start to look at the connections of education to health and well being. So we'll start to look at, you know, hey, did someone graduate from high school? Did they have an opportunity to enroll in higher education, go to college, whether it's a two year university, trade school, or four year university? So we're looking at educational attainment in general. We look at things such as language and literacy. So that's an individual's um, ability to recognize, understand, and process words and numbers. We also look at access to early childhood education and development. So did, were you able to go to preschool or some other uh, precursor before you enrolled in K-12 education? The third domain of the social determinants of health is the social and community context. So we look at the connections between where people live, learn, work, and play, those social determinants of health, and their health and well-being. So we look at things such as cohesion within a community. So what's going on in the neighborhood, your civic participation. Do you go out and participate uh, in local uh, efforts for voting, uh, discrimination, conditions in the workplace, and incarceration, specifically looking at rates of recidivism. The fourth domain of the social determinants of health is economic stability. So that's the connection between the financial resources people have. So we're looking at income, income. So things such as cost of living, socioeconomic status and their health. So we're looking at poverty, employment, under or over uh, unemployment, food security and housing stability. And then our last domain is the neighborhood and built environment. So that's the connections between where a person lives. So we look at housing, neighborhoods, and the environment. So we look at things such as housing, the quality of the housing, right? So do these homes have dust, moles, uh, critters, access to transportation? So if you live in a rural area, what does that look like for you being able to get to a medical facility? Availability of healthy foods. Do you have access to fresh fruits and vegetables? And your air and water quality, right? How are those pollutants in the air or your water impacting your health and neighborhood crime and violence? So when we talk about the social determinants of health, there are five domains. They all go hand in hand with each other and they're inseparable from one another. And so that leads me to ask you a question. When we consider the social determinants of health, we know that the social determinants of health are inseparable from the health of population. So thinking about what you know about Medicaid programs, how has, or given what we know about Medicaid programs, how have the social determinants of health uh, impacted Medicaid programs and influenced the health outcomes of populations? So how has Medicaid programs influenced the health outcomes of populations? What are some barriers in Medicaid programming that might impact the health outcomes of populations? Have you thought about it? Have you thought about it? So some of the things that come to mind for me would be literacy, right? What if people have problems filling out their Medicaid applications, right? Because we assume that people can read and understand things at the same level. The reading level, the national reading level is a sixth grade reading level, right? And that's even for individuals who have a college degree, who have a college degree. 
What about issues with co-payments? What about application processing timelines? What other barriers can you think about? These are things as we're going along and thinking about Medicaid policies that one has to consider, one really has to consider, especially when we talk about health outcomes of populations being influenced by the social determinants of health. There are many other ones that I have not mentioned, many other ones that I have not mentioned. And so what do we know about West Virginia? We know that West Virginia, um, in terms of population, whites make up 92.1% of the population. Black or African-American individuals make up 3.6% of the population. And the numbers dwindle as we start to look at other races. Now you notice that Hispanic is not on here because Hispanic is an ethnicity and not a race. So what does that really mean, right? What does that really mean? When we look at the data for the West Virginia Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, or the BRFIS data, the report shows that disparities are seen in the numbers. We know that West Virginia ranks number one for hypertension. We rank number two for diabetes. We rank number one for the prevalence of obesity. We rank number one for the opioid crisis. We rank number one for poor mental health and low physical activity. And if you are African-American, if you are low income, that's all races, or you identify as a marginalized community, which would be like your LGBTQ plus community or your veterans, these numbers are far worse. And so it shows up in our numbers, specifically mortality in West Virginia, heart disease mortality rates is 19% higher than the national average. Cancer mortality rate is 17% higher. Diabetes more mortality rate is 53% higher than the national rate. When we look at COPD, mortality rate is 53% higher. Injury mortality rate is 70% higher. And then stroke mortality rate is 19% higher than the national rate. So when we consider our state, West Virginia, all counties, all cities, we have problems and we have issues that we need to start addressing now. And so let's talk about Medicaid for a little bit, because if you really, really want to understand Medicaid in West Virginia, there's some things that you just need to know. So Medicaid, as we know, provides health coverage to millions of Americans, including eligible low-income adults, pregnant women, elderly adults, and people with disabilities. We know that a Medicaid is administered by the states according to federal requirements, and the program is funded jointly by states and the federal government. So beginning in 2014, we had the Affordable Care Act that provided states the authority to expand Medicaid eligibility to individuals under the age of 65 and families with low incomes below 133% of the federal poverty level and for determining eligibility and providing benefits through Medicaid, CHIP, and health insurance marketplace. Therefore, Medicaid is the single largest source of health care coverage in the United States. So what does that mean for West Virginia? So Medicaid in West Virginia is available for legal residents who qualify and to the age, blind, and disabled. So that's infants age zero to one in households with a certain income level uh, below the poverty level, children age one to five in households, children age six to 18, pregnant women, adults with incomes up to 138% of the poverty level, uh, pregnant and women and children in households with up to 300% of the federal poverty limit qualify for CHIP in West Virginia, um, and different coverage levels are available depending on income. I said all that to say that the total number of people enrolled under Medicaid declined slightly in 2017 to about 174,000 individuals in West Virginia, and further declined to about 165,000 individuals by March of 2018. However, the number kind of shot back up in 2021, largely due to in part to the COVID pandemic. So we had about 189,000, almost close to 190,000 individuals who were enrolled in Medicaid coverage. So West Virginia's Medicaid enrollment, including both individuals eligible and enrolled under pre uh, ACA eligibility requirements, plus those eligible and enrolled under the ACA's expansion criteria, was roughly around 588,000 as of July of 2021. So that was the last number that I have reported. So I asked you before, how does social determinants of health 
health disparities, and health equity show up in Medicaid programming. But what about Medicaid policies, the policies that we put in place, the legislation, the legal aspects, right? So a great professor by the name of Dr. Daniel Dawes has what's known as the political determinants of health. And we really start to look at how does rulemaking legislation impact the health outcomes of populations, right? That's a societal structure that's embedded into the policies that we enact. And so when we look at West Virginia, what do we know about the average time it takes for Medicaid applications to be processed? And so the CDC had this wonderful data that was updated um, as of recently to March of 2022. And so what I really want you to take away from this, so Medicaid application process times can be less than 24 hours, between one to seven days, eight to 30 days, 31 to 45 days, and over 45 days. And so if you look down at my arrow when we look at West Virginia, uh, what I really want you to take away from this graphic is that there are 38 other states who's processing or who processes Medicaid applications at higher rates than West Virginia. So either at less than 24 hours or within the one to seven day time frame, 38 other states are, are processing Medicaid applications at higher rates um, than West Virginia, which can be problematic, right? Which can be problematic. And so I ask you, how might this health inequity time, time and access impact health outcomes of populations? So how can the processing of Medicaid applications or the slow processing of Medicaid application impact health outcomes of populations? How might that show up? Remember when we talk about health inequities, right, or health equity, we're talking about differences in affordability, access, and utilization of healthcare services, and any other factor that impacts the ability to provide care. Medicaid processing time would impact your ability to uh, provide care to individuals, correct? What else have you thought about or have you thought about it? How might this health inequity of time impact health outcomes of populations? Let's take it a step further. So what do we know about Medicaid policies in West Virginia? We know that the health is in all policies and many areas of public policy can impact health and health can impact many different policy goals. So in West Virginia and other states in the United States, thousands of bills are introduced during each term of Congress, but most of them never become laws. And so if you're not familiar with a lot of policy and a lot of policy initiatives, Legiscan, Legiscan is a wonderful site. It's a real-time legislative tracking uh, service designed for both public citizens and government affairs professionals uh, across all sectors and organizations to kind of stay up to date with what's happening in your state regarding policies. And so when you visit Legiscan, uh, this site kind of brings people to the process, I say, because they believe that each individual uh, in a democracy has a voice, and it is through increased awareness and engagement that you facilitate that voice. So you go to these public meetings and you get a chance to voice your concerns. Now on Legiscan, they have a lot of policies that have been introduced by either the House or the Senate. They tell you what senator, representative uh, that are sponsoring the bills that you see. And the good thing about Legiscan is you have an opportunity to read up on the bills, figure out what's going on, and you can reach out directly to those sponsors of those bills, whether it's a delegate, a senator, and tell them what you think about the bills that they're trying to enact in the legislation, which is wonderful, right? And so I really kind of want to talk about a couple of bills. So when I was doing or starting my presentation, I said, well, Georgiana, what's been going on with Medicaid in the state of West Virginia, right? What's going on? You know, we have to educate ourselves. And so I was able to find five different bills that was directly related to Medicaid in the 2020 regular session um, that would have impacted Medicaid in West Virginia. And so we're going to talk a little bit about them. The main thing that I want you to know as we go along throughout or talk about some of these bills, the bills that were sponsored in the House and the two bills that were sponsored in the Senate, they all died in committee. So they never came to fruition. 
And so when we look at House Bill 4698, this was sponsored by Delegate Mike Pushkins. It was introduced in February of, uh, of this year, and it was requiring West Virginia Medicaid managed care organizations to contract with any otherwise qualified provider. And so we'll just jump down to the note. So the purpose of this bill was to require West Virginia Medicaid managed care organizations to allow in their network any willing provider, which is other five qualified and credential at the same time reimbursement rate and other terms uh, the same as comparable providers. So they were trying to recognize any provider uh, who was qualified and credential to participate in the Medicaid managed care program. And so when you think about this, right, when you think about this, how might the social determinants of health influence this Medicaid policy and potentially impact health outcomes of populations? So again, if we go back and look at House Bill 4698, Again, this bill died in committee. It never saw the day of light. And so the purpose of the bill, again, was to require that West Virginia Medicaid managed care organizations allow in their network any willing provider, which is otherwise qualified and credential, to be a part of that network, right? So again, how might the social determinants of health, health disparities, health equity access, influence this Medicaid policy and potentially impact health outcomes of populations. And so a lot of times when you look at policies, um, sometimes the wording is confusing, right? You have to break that stuff down. We talked about language and literacy. And so if you're not someone who's really up to date on your policies, a lot of times in West Virginia, policies either get passed by just a few votes um, and they kind of like slide under the radar. They slide under the radar. And so again, I ask you to take a step back sometimes and actually go and investigate these bills and these policies and see what communities will they impact, what populations of individuals will they impact. Maybe it's directly related to something um, to you and your family, right? Why do people get involved? Why do people get engaged through advocacy efforts? And it's usually through something that has a direct impact on them, someone they know, the communities that they serve, the organizations in which they work for, right? And so just things to consider. They also had House Bill 2127, which was sponsored back in January of this year. And it was relating to the state's Medicaid home and community-based service intellectual development disability waiver. And so the purpose of this bill was to require that West Virginia Bureau for Medical Services to file a request with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services or CMS for an amendment to the current IDDD waiver that will reinstate the terms of the amended waiver that was approved in place prior to 20, 20, January, July of 2017 and to require that the Bureau to seek legislative approval before filing a future request to amend or renew a waiver in a manner that alters the scope of nature of services provided under current under a current waiver. And so I said a lot, right? I said a lot. So think about that if you have someone who maybe never um, got a chance to finish high school, go to a, a college or a university. When you're reading these bills or you're reading what's trying to get passed through legislation, this can be confusing. This can be confusing. And so again, I ask the question then, how might the social determinants of health influence this Medicaid policy and potentially impact health outcomes of populations, right? And so one of the things that I wanted to highlight about this bill um, was that the commissioner's rationale and justification for requesting changes to the terms of a current IDD waiver services um, was all about being able to estimate cost or savings to the state if the requested changes are approved by a federal agency. Um, they also wanted to um, say that if the House or the legislator fails to adopt the proposal that uh, the commissioner is not required to receive legislative approval prior, prior to filing any request in terms of IDD waiver services in West Virginia. And so again, these things can have detrimental uh, uh, impacts to communities that we serve, um, the organizations that we represent, when you're not really engaged in the policy efforts that's taking place behind the scenes or these political determinants of health. House Bill 3001, it was introduced back in January of this year, and it was 
its aim was to create an affordable Medicaid buy-in program. And so it says the purpose of this bill is to create the affordable Medicaid buy-in program. This bill requires that the Department of Health and Human Resources develop and administer the affordable Medicaid buy-in plan. The bill creates the Healthcare Affordability and Access Improvement Fund. The bill would establish an advisory council to the affordable Medicaid buy-in program. The bill would require a study and reposts be made. The bill defines terms. The bill sets limitations of employers, what employers can and cannot do. The bill would require rulemaking. And the bill would appropriate $12 million to the Healthcare Affordability and Access Improvement Fund and $12 million to the Department of Health and Human Resources. Again, if you know anything about policy, we need money for programming. We need money for programming. And so again, as we go through this, and I'll let you look at this for a minute, because I, again, it's a lot, it's wordy, right? It's very wordy. And so even for me, when I had to go back and look at these bills, I had to sit with them for a while and say, hey, what is this bill or, or, or this legislation? What are we really trying to do here? And how is this going to impact the health of the community? And so again, I always go back and ask you the same question, right? How might the social determinants of health influence this Medicaid policy and potentially impact health outcomes of populations. So they talked about a little, a, a bunch of things in this in this bill. They wanted to have this uh, Medicaid uh, buy-in advisory board. What would that look like? Really, who would regulate who? Who were the individuals that would serve on this advisory board? A lot of things are included. If you go back and read this bill that they tried to pass, a lot of things is included in this in this bill, from the plan to the administration of it. Uh, from the financing of the bill, they talked about the $12 million, how individuals would be enrolled in the Medicaid buy-in plan, and the advisory council, which I mentioned, and the limitation of the employers. What can employers do and what can they not do in terms of Medicaid health care coverage um, that they offer? Now, moving out of the House, we move into the Senate, right? So in Congress, you have the House and the Senate. And when you think about what it takes or requires for bills to pass, so normally, if, you know, we probably, a lot of us probably haven't had a history class since elementary school, right? Unless that was our major in college. And so a lot of times we forget the process of, for bills becoming laws. And so in Congress, you have the House and the Senate. So if a bill originates in the House, it has to be approved in the House before it's sent off to the Senate. It also has to be approved in the Senate um, before it can become a bill. Now, if either one of the House or the Senate doesn't agree on the language, whatever's included in that bill, we have to come back and like make some changes and some adjustments to it before we can pass it on um, onto the next party. And so when we look at Senate Bill 620, this was a bill that was sponsored in February of this year, and the purpose of the bill was to increase the maximum annual dental coverage for Medicaid recipients from $1,000 to $1,500. So I want to increase dental coverage for Medicaid recipients from $1,000 to $1,500. Keep in mind, I said all of the bills that we're currently looking at died in committee. So none of these bills actually made it to fruition, right? So why would individuals not want to approve a bill where we're raising dental coverage for Medicaid recipients from $1,000 to $1,500? Again, my same question, how might the social determinants of health influence this Medicaid policy and potentially impact the health outcomes of populations? What do we know? What do we know? And so when you think about this bill, um, it talks a little bit about cosmetic services not being included. Uh, so that's uh, dental work that improves the appearance of the teeth, gums, or bite. And so we know, thinking about West Virginia, right? I said that West Virginia was the number one opioid crisis state in the world. So what does that mean in terms of the drug uses or the substances that people abuse in their dental or oral health, right? So we don't provide... Uh, cosmetic services under this plan. However, 
it did or it would help with diagnostic and preventative service. So uh, any kind of dental work where it maintains good oral health, including your oral evaluations, uh, your routine cleanings, x-rays, fluoride treatments, fillings and extractions, um, and restorative services means dental work that involves tooth replacement, including but not limited to dentures, dental implants, bridges, crowns, um, or corrective procedures as root canals, right? So again, this bill did not come into fruition. So they wanted to increase the dental coverage from $1,000 to 1,500. We also have Senate Bill 158. So the purpose of this bill where it was about collecting and analyzing statistical information pertaining to terminating pregnancies under Medicaid program. So abortion, family planning, reproductive services is really under a tight microscope right now, right? A tight microscope. And West Virginia is not left, left off that list. And so the purpose of this bill was to require the collection and analysis of data relating to the delivery of pregnancy termination services through the West Virginia Medicaid program. So essentially this bill will require healthcare providers seek reimbursement for pregnancy termination services to submit reports for each instance of service identifying the health, social and economic factors contributing to the decision to terminate a pregnancy. And so the Department of Health and Human Resources would be required to analyze the data and make regular reports to the governor and the legislation. So again, think about this, right? So I asked, how might the social determinants of health influence this Medicaid policy and potentially impact health outcomes of populations, right? And so in this bill, um, if you go back and read it, they talk about um, when a physician, they have to talk about the physical condition, they have to talk about a mental condition of the patient, their emotional condition, their psychological condition, if they uh, experience any kind of substance use or dependency, uh, other medical considerations, other familiar situation, age consideration, there's a lot of things that goes into this bill that would have to be documented or imported um, as verification of why a pregnancy termination um, was required and if Medicaid coverage would actually cover that procedure or not, right? We have strict abortion laws right now. So how does that impact the communities, the organizations, and the individuals that you serve? So again, I try to get you to think a broader picture, a broader aspect of the social determinants of health in relation to Medicaid policies, in relation to Medicaid policies which leads us to a public health practice approach, right? So you, like myself, we work in public health in the state of West Virginia. We know we have a lot of work to do in terms of health and health outcomes. And so solution number one, and I ask you to ask yourself this question, ask yourself this question. I always like to make it personable back to myself um, first, right? What will you do to raise awareness about Medicaid programs and policies for the state and the communities you serve? And so much like when I'm teaching my students over at Marshall, I ask them, you know, whatever healthcare career that they want to go into, whatever disease or condition that they want to study, how can you effectively teach or train someone about something that you're not even an expert in yourself, right? So when we talk about policies, Medicaid policies, we talk about Medicaid programming. What will you do to raise awareness about the Medicaid programs and policies for the state and the communities you serve? What do you know? How do you translate that information into the most important populations or the communities um, that's really going to uh, have or experience the direct impact of the programs and the policies that we see? All of us in here are a part of some organization and workforce, right? So how will your organization recognize those social determinants of health impacting Medicaid programs? And what are two things you all can incorporate into practice to address health inequities resulting from the social determinants of health? So we start off by addressing what can we do as an individual, and then we move into what can we do as a team, as an organization. So how will your organization recognize those social determinants of health, those five domains, impact on Medicaid programs, and what are the two things that you can incorporate into practice to address health inequities resulting from the social determinants of health at your organization? 
And the third step or the third solution is something that really takes a lot of time, right? A lot of people get fed up when it comes to policy or advocacy work because it's time consuming and it's very labor intensive. And I think most of us who work in the state of West Virginia can justify that this is so, right? We are slow sometimes in our policy initiatives. But when we think about Medicaid programming, what policies can we advocate for in efforts to address the social determinants, social determinants of health in Medicaid programming, internal and external? So I mean, at your organizational, at your state, local level, at the national level, what policies can we advocate for in efforts to address the social determinants of health in Medicaid programs internally and externally? I covered what, five programs or five bills that was sponsored in the West Virginia legislation for the 2022 regular session, and all of them died in committee. So we have a lot of work to do with getting Medicaid policies passed in our state, passed in our state. And so what do we know? What's currently going on in the news? What's currently going on in the news? And so I found this article um, that was posted by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. This article was published on August 31st of this year. So just a few days ago in my mind. And it says that the Biden-Harris administration proposes to make healthcare enrollment easier for millions of Americans. And so they really wanted to propose several new changes to the current Medicaid program to make healthcare enrollment easier for all individuals. And so if you go back and read this article, um, they have about seven different things that they wanted to modify uh, in relation to Medicaid programming. So I'll just talk about a few. They wanted to end the lifetime benefit limits and chip and allow children to enroll in coverage right away by eliminating pre-enrollment waiting periods consistent with nearly all other healthcare coverage. They want to permit states to transfer children's eligibility directly from Medicaid to CHIP when a family income rises, preventing unnecessary redetermination processing from causing lapse in, courage, in coverage. They also wanted to streamline the application process. I told you that West Virginia is currently, you know, doing kind of bad in processing Medicaid application uh, applications, right? 38 states are processing applications at a faster rate than West Virginia. And so they wanted to streamline this process by removing unnecessary administrative hurdles for people who do not have, but are eligible for Medicaid CHIP uh, coverage. And so they also wanted to include policies that would improve access to programs that help make coverage more affordable for older adults and individual with disabilities. They wanted to allow for automatic enrollment in Medicare saving programs for certain individuals receiving Social Security Administrative Supplement Security Income. And they wanted to automatically consider older adults for Medicare saving programs enrollment. And then they also highlighted that proper documentation is critical to enabling appropriate oversight, identifying errors in the state policies and operations, and reducing inconsistent and outdated practices across the state, which contribute to improper payments. So they would like to update and standardize record keeping requirements for states, which would help to address deficiencies in outdated state record keeping systems and improve program integrity. So if you go back and look at the updates that the Biden-Harris administration is trying to make in the Medicaid uh, programming, you would be shocked at the things that have kind of been going on behind the scenes or are going left kind of unchecked, if you will, that's really impacting the health of the populations uh, in the communities in which we serve. And so I say all that to leave you with this final, final quote, because I want to save time for questions and answers. And so I really like referencing Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was a strong component of, of human rights and dignity, a civil rights pioneer. And he says that all of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. So of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. So with that, I thank you. My name is Dr. Georgiana Logan. I can be reached at the following telephone number and my email is on here as well, logang at marshall.edu. And I will turn it back over to our panel uh, for questions.
I'm going to just go ahead and unmute um, rather than type this out. Um, this is, <laughs> yeah, that's me. Um, so do you think given, you know, your presentation, which was excellent, by the way, um, do you think that, that the Medicaid program is one of the best paths, I, I would think, um, given how many people are registered in it and how, how large of a program it is? to addressing social determinants of health like it could it be a leader in um in doing that right so yeah the medicaid program has done some tremendous works throughout the years right we know we had the affordable care act we did medicaid expansion even though medicaid expansion is not available in all states west virginia did you know vote to expand medicaid which is great um and so i think again when you go back medicaid is a policy right it's a policy initiative and so with any policies you're going to have pros you're going to have cons but i think the main thing that we have to understand is when when people are coming up with these programs and these policies, people are doing the programs and policies. And so it's important to know who has a direct tie into creating these policies uh, for at the federal level that will ultimately get passed down to the state level. And so if you have a diverse group of individuals working on these policies, things such as social determinants of health maybe um, will get caught at a much earlier stage. And so we don't really have all the blowback or, or the results that we see um, when we talk about health disparities and Medicaid programming. So I think the Medicaid programming serves as one aspect of addressing social determinants of health, but people control policies and the things that we do. And so we really have to put a, a key focus on our infrastructure and the people who we put in positions uh, that make these rules and regulations that impact overall health for communities and populations of folks. And then, and then my follow up to that, because I, I spoke to you prior to this webinar, could you like, you know, you, you mentioned, of course, that Medicaid is a policy. Could you just real quick, I think people would be interested to know about the political determinants of health and how that ties in. Right. So I talked about, I mentioned Dr. Daniel Dawes, who's a professor over at Morehouse School of Medicine. He coined the term political determinants of health. He actually has a book out. You can probably find it on Amazon or uh, any other bookstore that you probably look in. So the political determinants of health really takes an inside look at how society has embedded structural and systemic barriers of uh, through our policies, um, through a historical context, right? So when we create our rules, laws, bills, regulations, whatever you want to call them, right? How has history played a role in the health outcomes that we see through the laws that we have enacted. Um, he goes back and he talks about like the Civil Rights Bill and the Act and all the provisions that are in that. A lot of times people look at the Civil Rights Act and they only look at it for like what they think about like racial uh, ad advances in society, but it's a lot of stuff in the Civil Rights Bill, um, a lot of uh, uh, um, sections in that that ties directly into health and healthcare. And so, again, when you think about the political determinants of health in terms of Medicaid, how has society historically played a role in developing that program and those uh, those policies that directly impact the health incomes of uh, the health outcomes of population? So it requires you to go back a little bit and know how or why was Medicaid started in the first place? Um, what did it look like initially, and how has it evolved over time? That, that's really just kind of blown my mind. You've put a label to um, to what we do. You know, we work through healthcare policy. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm really going to look more into that. And I'm, I'm so grateful for you, you know, not only speaking here, but illuminating uh, of that aspect of it to us because um, it actually kind of leads into what we're doing uh, coming up with our healthcare forms. Because yeah. you can't be healthy without, you can't have a healthy community or healthy society without healthy policies. Right. Exactly. And so I tell people all the time, right, you have to go back without understanding history. You really won't understand what's happening in society today. And that's for any program and policy. And then again, I always encourage people to remember 
People create policies, people create programs. That's for myself, that's for everybody else on this call, right, who does any kind of work in the public health sector, social work, nursing, any kind of healthcare field that you think of, right? And so if we're not educated on the things that we're trying to do, it can really impact the programs and the policies that we set up or the ways in which we think and process information impacts the things that we do or don't do when we're creating policies and programs. Um, and we all have our own life experiences, um, our own uh, experiences with the healthcare system, and all of that stuff factors in everything that we do, whether you realize it consciously or unconsciously. Absolutely. I think we all know that health is a holistic mm -hmm. um, state. And I think that we're, what do you think? Um, do you think that the general uh, healthcare industry, the populace are starting to comprehend how essential it is for us to focus on social determinants of health? Do you think you see some progress in that? In that? I think you start to see some progress, but a lot of times when you talk about the social determinants of health, a lot of people, advocacy efforts only go so far. And a lot of advocacy efforts are a result of things that impact individuals or their direct or immediate family, friends, right? And so sometimes I tell people, you know, we turn a blind eye to a lot of things. We unconsciously or consciously know things are happening. We know when there's differences um, in our communities. We know when people are being treated unfairly. But will you have the courage to stand up and speak out on those social determinants of health that we see happening. And so a lot of times individuals like myself and you all, we have to use our privileges and our power that we have to really change the dynamics that we see in programming and policies in the state. Um, and sometimes we don't tap into that power and privilege that we all possess. Well, I think, um, I think Flint and West Virginia are good examples of of, of how we need to, to focus more on the social determinants of health. I mean, I think those are great. We're great, you know, miles, you know, kind of um, uh, examples, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, growing up in Flint and the water crisis, is, that's still is happening. Right? That's right, still going right, on, right? Right. And that started back in 2014. You think we're almost 10 years into this, and it's still individuals in Flint who do not have clean, safe drinking water because of the, the deficiencies in the infrastructure uh, and the chemicals that were eroding the pipes, leading to like the lead poisoning and the Legionnaire's disease, all these different outbreaks that you see. Um, and so it's really unfortunate. And even I talk a little bit about my class, a lot of people are not familiar with like Minden, West Virginia. And I talk about like the water park that's there and but how the community that's in that immediate area, you know, they don't have the same water source as the water park, right? And if you really go back and look at what happened in Minden, West Virginia, it's a tragedy. And they have some of the highest cancer rates in the world. And it still hasn't been condemned, you know, as, as a place where people really shouldn't be living. So, which is really sad. So go back and look at the history of Minden, West Virginia as well. And we have a lot of flooding and other environmental and climate issues that happen in West Virginia that impact health. Um, and sometimes policy initiatives are not that great in those areas either. Yeah, I agree. Let me see. There's something else in the question here. Oh, um, we have a question from a participant. Um, would you comment on how you see climate policy and health policy as connected? Uh, climate crisis impacts um, often hit low income uh, commu and communities of color the hardest. Could you um, comment on that, please? Right. So I do a lot of work in terms of like climate, health and equity. Um, I sit on the advisory board for the American Public Health Association, which is the largest uh, public health association in the world. And so we really talk a lot about when you experience communities experience climate crises or environmental injustices. What does it mean in terms of resilience for communities' ability to bounce back and recover when these adverse events happen, right? And so, again, I talked about flooding, right? A lot of people don't have flood insurance. What happens, you know, when, when flooding uh, occurs and you don't have the necessary resources, the monetary resources to... Uh, 
really bounce back from those events. Uh, we also talk about air quality, water quality. Um, if you live in an area where there's a chemical plant around or some kind of factory, what does that mean for your water and soil quality in those areas? Um, I like the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, because you can go on their website and they tell you about the toxins that's in the communities and neighborhoods in which you live in, what are some of the most toxic pollutants in that area. Um, and so I think a lot of times we don't do a great job at educate individuals in the community about what's going on and what they can do to kind of um, kind of address um, some of those crises, crises that we see in the low income and communities of color. Um, a lot of communities of color and low income populations um, suffer from, you know, inadequate or poor housing, um, climate impacts that, right? It's hot, it's raining a lot. What happens when you talk about dust, mold, and mites? Um, children start to experience asthma. Um, there's a lot of things that happen in climate and, and health policy. They go hand in hand, um, and none of this stuff can really be separated by themselves. There's if so much. It's in such somebody. a wide field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're really interested in climate policy and health policy, go to the EPA website. They have a wonderful timeline where they talk about um, acts of environmental justice and climate justice um, up until like recent. Um, so they have this timeline where you can look at all of these different events that have happened um, throughout society and the world in relation to climate and environmental uh, injustices. Wow, that's cool. I didn't know that they had a resource like that. That's very cool. Yes, it's really nice. Let me see, was there, I thought I saw another question in there. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, put your, put it in the Q&A. And if we don't have any more, um, Dr. Logan, I, I am blown away, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, as an educator, what I thought of while I was hearing you speak and while I was thinking of, um, you know, what our state needs, what I was thinking was I hope that every med student at Marshall is taking your class. Every health administrator uh, student is taking your class and every social work student, at least those, maybe everybody, to expand mm -hmm. on what our definition of health and health care are. So yeah, well, I that's, appreciate that's I that. No, well, I don't see any med school students. I hardly ever see social work students. But again, wow. you know, I teach in health sciences and public health. And I think I'm probably one of the only professors um, at Marshall who really talk about like health disparities, health equity, um, environmental justice, all of these different concerns that's happening in the state of West Virginia. My students are always shocked, right? I make them go out and investigate policies. I make them do community assessments. So environmental audits, uh, grocery store audits, fast forward, all kind of things, um, because I know that they do want to go into some of those fields that I don't teach in nursing, uh, like you said, med school, I don't teach in those programs. But if I can get the undergraduate students or, or our graduate public health students to kind of at least think about this in a broader context, hopefully I'm doing something uh, to make them better healthcare professionals as a whole, right? So, you know, we need clinical medicine, but we know we like to focus really uh, more on preventative services in the first place over in our public health realm. Well, I think your classes would be beneficial to, to all those students. That's the way I see it, because we work with a lot of the social work students from Marshall mm -hmm. every year during session, and it's to build, to build the future leaders of West Virginia. Mm -hmm. We want them yes. to understand these these complex structures and systems so yeah i think everybody should take your class everybody well, in those fields thank you sure. thank you definitely and um just thank you so much um i think we're going to wrap it up here in time and i'm just so grateful for you we hit the jackpot we did when we when we chose you on and um i'm so grateful for you being here and it kind of leads into um you know our uh our candidate forums. Our Kanawha County candidate forums uh, is actually going to be centered around the topics that we've discussed today. So I'm really excited about that one because like you said, um, the political determinants of health, it's my new favorite phrase. Um, we have to understand that, you know, our candidates need to, first of all, learn from people like you about these things because a lot of these, these folks uh, only work two months 
out of the year, you know, really as a legislator and they have other jobs. And so they need to be educated on this. And we also as citizens need to be able to ask them the important questions about health and health care and what their policies are, what they believe, what they think they would vote for. So um, I'm super excited to go into that forum with this, with all this knowledge that, that you've given us. So thank you so much. Thank you. Like I said, I'm just happy. Um, uh, I'm appreciative of the fact and humbled by the invitation to speak on today. I hope something that I said resonates, um, you know, with everyone that you can take back to your own organization and even to your own household. Right. Because I told you, bring it back to the individual level, bring it back to us. Um, And so thank you again so much for the opportunity. Yeah. Wonderful. Let me um, let let me end by giving uh, folks a little bit of information about our ca- our candidate forums. We're having our first one um, on, I'm let my notes so I get all the dates right. Um, our first one is this Monday, this coming up Monday, and that's the Cabell County Forum. And we're doing that one in, um, in uh, coalition with uh, the League of Women Voters. They've helped us with our candidate forums uh, and we're just so grateful to have them. So that will be um, next Monday, September 26th. Our Wood County Forum would be October 4th. Monongalia will be October 11th. And these will all be virtual forums. And the Kanawha County live stream from Baptist Church in, in Charleston. find the links to our events um, on Facebook, uh, on our Facebook page, Healthcare for All West Virginia. So thank you all so much for attending um, all of the segments of our Medicaid Summit, and um, we appreciate you. Take care. Mm-hmm.